Hmm. OK, good morning, everyone. Um, thank you for joining us for session three, which is uh, the making of crypto comics. And in this session, we'll hear from Dr. David Hatch, who is the NSA historian, um, as well as Wade Forbes, who uh, if you've been watching uh, the link uh, on some of the previous sessions. He is uh, this NSA's visual historian, uh, obviously a person of tremendous graphic uh, talent. But before I uh, turn things over to Dave and Wade to sort of uh, describe the journey that Crypto Comics has been on for the last couple of years now, I just want to put my own two cents into it. Um, as you know, as Dave will will tell you shortly, he's been a comic book fan for for most of his life, uh, as as have I, and um, it's really been an idea of mine to try to you know reach uh, an extended audience. Um, as you might imagine, an NSA has a very technically centric, techno centric uh, workforce. That might not otherwise be predisposed to traditional forms of, of history, even cryptologic history. And, you know, I met Wade, um, I don't even know how many years ago, more than 10 probably, um, but if not somewhere close to 10 years ago, when the two of us worked together in US Cyber Command, uh, he was an Intel analyst, I was a, a strategic and operational level planner. And, in running in running planning teams for various uh, planning efforts that we were undertaking, you'd often find yourself in a conference room with a dozen or so people trying to brainstorm ideas and come up with concepts. You know, this is before the actual hard writing of the planning happens. Um, those of you with some experience in military parlance, you might have heard the term operational design. Um, and so when you're doing that level of, of brainstorming, if you will, or design work, at least in my mind, it's it's always helpful to have uh, some sort of visual reference. And, and you know, I'm a I'm a visual learner to begin with. But when Wade was there as a red teamer or just a, a, an intel analyst in some of these planning meetings, he would often just get up behind me while I'm talking and leading this planning group, and he would just start. Um, drawing and sketching on the whiteboard behind me and I'd find myself turning around like wait what are you doing and next thing you know all these ideas all these concepts are there in a in a graphic textual combination manner that um, really was amazing to watch but also a, a, a tremendous aid to the to the planning process flash forward to me taking over the history center now almost uh, six years ago um, and trying to think of new ways to reach new members of the workforce. I was trying to, uh, and, and I just started, I reached out to Wade at one point and I said, you know, maybe you could draw some things for us. And um, without without going into any more detail, because I know Dave's going to talk you through that whole uh, evolution, if you will, um, we're able to make the the the, the graphics and the, and the, uh, the the crypto comics that that you come to enjoy both uh, inside and outside that we publish digitally. So Dave, I'm going to kick it over to you and Wade and thanks again for both of you for helping. Take what was just a germ of an idea in my mind and make it something that has been uh, increasingly popular with with the workforce and the general public. Thank you, John. And, uh... Thank you for uh, um, making it possible to skip the first half dozen slides. Um, uh, I'm joking. Uh, you, you, you know I'm not going to do that uh, if you know me. Uh, may I have the first slide, please? The um, Center for Cryptologic History was formed in 1990. Uh, Admiral uh, William Studeman, the then director, wanted to have uh, a place where the history of the institution could be studied and uh, promulgated. Uh, he had a degree in history himself, was very aware of 
the uses of history in a large organization to, to uh, learn from uh, the past, the hard-won lessons of the past, as he put it, uh, to uh, build unit cohesion and to uh, raise morale. Um, so uh, a number of functions were centered, uh, were combined, uh, centralized to form the Center for Cryptologic History. There had been historians at NSA uh, probably since World War II, maybe with a few gaps here and there, but there'd been a small group of uh, people to uh, research, write history, answer questions, um, and maintain a collection of artifacts. These were centralized in 1990. Those of us who came into the center in 1990 were from the old school, frankly. Uh, we were all committed to traditional history, uh, to the written word. It's frequently said, and in fact was said at the uh, last session of the symposium I attended, that intelligence doesn't do any good if it doesn't reach the intended recipients. Well, the same thing is true with history. Historians, uh, including myself, are uh, working in the field because we love it. Uh, we enjoy uh, studying and recreating the past. However, uh, we all like an audience and uh, we do not write things strictly for our own uh, amusement. Uh, well, actually we do, but we, we like to have an audience as well. Um, Fortunately, the Center for Cryptologic History has provided uh, a venue for taking the written output that we uh, have produced and, and uh, distributing it literally around the world, certainly within cleared spaces for classified histories, but many of our uh, cla unclassified or declassified histories have been mailed around the world. Uh, next slide, please. Just a couple of the examples of uh, uh, unclassified and declassified histories, uh, all of which uh, you may find uh, at uh, www.nsa.gov, as John has already uh, said in his introduction. Uh, go to the history link and uh, follow it on. Uh, NSA, in its wisdom, is put together uh, at uh, great trouble. Uh, one of the least user-friendly websites uh, in the federal government. However, uh, finding the history stuff is relatively easy. Just go to the link at the top that says history. Uh, next slide, please. In an attempt to reach uh, a new audience, uh, one that uh, may not have the time to uh, read a very large book, may not have the inclination to read a very large book. Uh, since 2003, the History Center has been producing a daily history article. Uh, this will uh, highlight uh, interesting stories, uh, show uh, interesting uh, photographs or other graphics from the past, uh, and generally be readable within about five minutes uh, or 10, so that it does not distract from the workday. Uh, there was a immediate uh, interest shown in this feature, and it has always had a very high readership and a great deal of feedback. Uh, it has sparked one of uh, NSA's most popular games, uh, Gotcha, uh, in which uh, our typos um, uh, misstatements of fact and uh, uh, sometimes controversial interpretations are uh, subject to, uh, shall we say, uh, feedback from the uh, from the workforce. Uh, but uh, next slide. As we were producing these things around the turn of the millennium, uh, John Tokar, the chief of the center, and I recognized that there was a generational change going on at NSA. Uh, not only was uh, a very large portion of the workforce technically oriented, uh, not uh, the kind that would sit down and read a, uh, uh, a 100 or 200 page history book, uh, but many of them really didn't relate to history at all. And even uh, a short article such as the History Today 
daily feature um, might not be attractive to them. It was an audience, a uh, new workforce uh, component that had grown up uh, with more visual orientation than verbal. Uh, uh, with uh, broadcast media, with uh, social media, used to short, punchy, and visual means of communication. Uh, as John explained in his introduction, uh, both of us uh, had been, and in my case at least, still were uh, fans of uh, comic books or comic strips. Uh, having uh, spent a good deal of my youth uh, perusing them. Next slide, please. It's just, uh, you know, Shazam. Uh, it's, a, it's a medium that's always been there and uh, responded to. Um, <clears throat> these are uh, examples of the comic book format, standalone publications. Uh, 90% uh, of which were uh, combinations of pictures and words to tell stories. The uh, newspaper comic strip also was uh, a very good uh, medium. Uh, I was very much attracted to it. And uh, even as a kid, uh, you know, aspired to uh, get involved in that sort of thing. It's on a sort of a long time uh, uh, interest of mine, uh, one in which I would have uh, liked to have personal involvement. And I think even as I appreciated uh, the uh, the color and action and stories that uh, uh, comic books and comic strips represented, uh, I was uh, looking at the underlying storytelling and saying, you know, if I were telling the story, how would I do it? Would I do it differently uh, or uh, would I do it the same? Whatever. Uh, so, uh, I have always looked on this kind of medium as a great storytelling vehicle, a great storytelling opportunity, if you will. It was interesting to find that uh, if my specific interest in comic books and comic strips was not necessarily shared by the um, upcoming generations, uh, they, they were still very much interested in the graphic format. Uh, next slide, please. Increasingly, it became apparent that graphic novels uh, were uh, not only a, a, a fad, but were becoming a uh, an important part of literature. Uh, they had attraction. They told not only exciting stories and stories of superheroes with uh, special words that would transform them into uh, unstoppable forces, uh, but they were used for serious literature as well. And in fact, so serious uh, a literature, uh, literary form uh, that they were actually reviewed by the New York Times and other major newspapers uh, and so on. Next slide, please. Uh, back when I was growing up, I spent many happy hours in uh, drugstores and supermarkets uh, because there would be uh, on any given day uh, at dozens and maybe even sometimes some places hundreds of new comic books on display and a lot of happy hours there uh, uh, reading uh, for free uh, a wide variety of stories. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, the newspaper uh, newsstand uh, venue for obtaining comic strips or comic books is no longer <clears throat> really uh, in existence, uh, except maybe in airports. Um, but uh, there is a new distribution network. Uh, the graphic novels are published by major publishers as well as uh, those who publish other kinds of graphic materials. Uh, Many adults, particularly in the demographic uh, that uh, John Tokar and I were uh, interested in uh, reaching, would read at least one uh, every month, and maybe multiple copies. Um, they represented uh, a, a significant 
portion of the sales at bookstores that were selling traditional uh, uh, verbal uh, mediums, media. Um, there were hu widely attended, hugely attended conventions or cons uh, every year uh, in uh, regional uh, jurisdictions and uh, with a national reach as well. And uh, as a habitué of libraries, I discovered that um, most modern libraries that I visited uh, had very large sections devoted to graphic novels. So this, this was clearly a medium that would appeal to the new generation of NSA employees uh, with a slightly uh, different orientation from uh, uh, us dinosaurs that grew up in the book era. It was with very great interest then that uh, John Tokar mentioned uh, that he had had experience with a graphic artist, uh, Wade Forbes, uh, and uh, put us together. Uh, Wade, why don't you take the next couple of slides? Sure, thanks again to the Center for Cryptologic History having me. Um, it was a dream come true, quite honestly, when they said, Wade, can you be a visual historian and bring this content to life? Uh, at the same time, it was a chance for me to grow as an artist. I wouldn't say I had any comic book experience and drawing in this format that Dave and John were just talking about in their introductions, but it was an opportunity for me to grow. Um, so uh, I can I can tell you that from drawing the history department um, symposium and drawing the stories that Dave has written for me, I've learned way more about history than I ever would have learned uh, had I just been going about my normal walks of life. So this has been a really enriching project for me, uh, especially, and I can explain to you a little more about that on the next couple of slides. Next slide, please. So these are some of the sketch notes from a previous symposium. These are digital sketch notes that I did on my iPad Pro. It's an opportunity to capture the conversation in real time with a combination of pictures and words. This technique of sketch noting is something private that I'm doing as a conversation is happening and then I can share at a later time. There's another technique called graphic recording, which is large that can happen in the room with people where I'm drawing on an eight foot sheet of paper by four foot with very special markers from a company called Neuland in Germany that I can refill with ink that I won't get into too much detail about. But really what these are supposed to do is to help people remember. You're putting people in a moment, in a snapshot of time and saying, this is an artifact of when we gathered and we talked about these things. And you, you, the intent is you can pick up one of these sketch notes, look at some of the details and it puts you right back in the conversation. Uh, and it's a very useful tool for a lot of uh, different activities happening at the agency and within Cyber Command or any organization, quite frankly, uh, that John was mentioning earlier, especially when there's large amounts of information that have to be remembered and there's so many things competing for our attention. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, let me take this one just for um, a few seconds. I've already explained uh, uh, my personal background and my uh, early commitment to the uh, the, the written word. Um, uh, but uh, I had never heard of sketch notes, and John's introduction to Wade uh, was a real revelation to me. Uh, so you know my background. Wade, uh, why don't you try the next slide and uh, talk about your background? Thank you. So um, what you're going to see on this slide is that, is that I have a very non-traditional path to this conversation here with all of you today. I started as a performer. I was a theater major. I did seven years of theater, 31 plays, and while I was doing it professionally, I realized if I was any good at it, I'd never be home with the people I cared about. So then I spent a brief time teaching elementary school where I actually drew out a lot of the lessons for my students. Uh, I actually talked in different dialects that I learned as a theater major when I was teaching different subjects. And then while volunteering at the Baltimore Aquarium of all places, I met some folks at Booz Allen, which um, led me to Cyber Command, uh, to meeting John, and then all the years of consulting that I did with Cyber Command and NSA, where I was really relied upon to disrupt patterns and bring non-traditional or unorthodox thoughts to the conversation. There was a great article published 
uh, by August Cole in November 19th, 2014, where he talked about America's overlooked strategic assets are artists. And one of the things he said in the article, which really just kind of brought my life full circle for the work I'd been doing for the last 16 years with Cyber Command and NSA was, artists walk a fine line between knowing just enough and too much. They use what they know, but are not bound by it. This approach and risk-taking nature help bypass process and tradition. So now take everything that we've talked about today, how we're starting to add pictures and more visuals uh, to complement all the information that's out there. It's not necessarily meant to replace it, but it's meant to appeal to larger amounts of the audience that need a visual to kind of pique their interest or to help them remember. So um, at the beginning of the pandemic, I wasn't able to go back to Cyber Command as a, as a subcontractor. I've been doing work part-time with the Center for Cryptologic History. And now I'm in my home office here, a bedroom that I've converted to draw every single day. And I've been very grateful for the uh, collaboration with the history department. Uh, you, your audience is amazing. You do not miss any small details, uh, size of text, any reference, uh, accuracy of a portrait. So it's been really rewarding to me to learn to focus on those details and to bring these conversations to life. Uh, something Dave and I are going to talk about in a minute is even recreating scenes that no photographs exist for. So uh, next slide, please. So this was a great opportunity to look at the body of work that the Center for Cryptologic History was already providing to the workforce every, every federal workday, as Dave mentioned earlier, and looking at how could they add value and complement what was already there. Uh, I, I often say that my drawing shouldn't be a distraction to what's happening because it's just bringing uh, these conversations to the forefront. It's catching people's eyes in an era where we're scrolling on devices. How do we stop the scroll and get someone's attention to dwell a little bit longer and to notice what they're seeing? So I remember sitting in Cyber Command uh, on the days where I was supporting the strategic planners and the policy writers and doing operational design and one of my articles coming out and Dave and John sending me notes and saying, you know, hey, wait, this is really resonating with people. They're really excited about it. It's been something that um, we couldn't have imagined happening before because at times there were no photographs or anything in the archives that could really depict visually this event that had happened. So uh, next slide, please. Dave, do you want to talk about this one first? Um, well, sure. Um, not much to say except that we did concentrate at first on one-time drawings, um, events that we were writing about or people that we were focusing on uh, for whom no adequate photographs exist. One of the rules for our self-imposed rules for our History Today feature was that uh, each one should have uh, an illustration uh, and of course initially we were thinking in uh, terms of photographs uh, occasionally diagrams graphic uh, graphs uh, but uh, our eclectic collection of photographs at the uh, center for cryptologic history has many gaps in it also there are many events uh, that were never photographed they were never in a uh, position uh, uh, to be photographed uh, for may surprise many in the uh, in the group but for uh, decades uh, uh, there was no such thing as a camera on your telephone uh, and there was not ubiquitous um, photography of uh, virtually uh, every minute of uh, most people's lives uh, so uh, to provide uh, a good idea uh, either uh, an illustration of an actual event or as in the example shown sort of a metaphorical uh, 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 depiction of, of an event uh, uh, the artwork by Wade just uh, simply uh, extended the impact heightened the impact uh, that our individual stories would have uh, next slide, please. It was a natural division of effort uh, for uh, one of the historians at the CCH, principally uh, yours truly, 
uh, to come up with the scenario and then uh, Wade to do the artwork for it. Uh, my guiding principles in writing these uh, uh, stories, uh, John, uh, Wade and I loved doing these one-time drawings, but both of us wanted more. I think both of us were interested in the storytelling aspects of the artwork. So um, I began to draft um, uh, stories uh, or scenarios that had more than one picture necessary and eventually developing uh, a whole story such as a, a small comic book story or the perhaps more accurately the extended story that you would find in a Sunday uh, Sunday supplement uh, comic section uh, of your newspaper. I certainly wanted every story to be accurate, <clears throat> although of course uh, uh, we needed to tell the story succinctly, so uh, a little bit of telescoping of a story uh, was absolutely necessary. And of course, uh, there was no room for uh, extensive dialogue. So uh, dialogue had uh, had to be compressed, uh, even if the, the, the drawings did not. Uh, determined that every story that we did this way should be self-contained, uh, relatively short. Um, and uh, Wade has mentioned that um, his artwork uh, was intended not to get in the way of the story. I think both of us saw this new uh, way of doing it, the uh, multi-panel multi scenarios, as a, a meshing of story and artwork. It wasn't that one was dominating. Uh, sometimes uh, the story could only be told through uh, dialogue or through uh, uh, an explana a, a verbal explanation of uh, <clears throat> a concept or a, a setting. And sometimes only the, the artwork would tell the story. Uh, and uh, with uh, most of the stories, there were a certain percentage that were only artwork, a certain percentage where the words dominated, but in most of them, it was a meshing, a combination, uh, a fusion, if you will, of uh, words and art. Um, this required us to avoid too much uh, of the professional jargon that characterizes our uh, our profession uh, required us uh, to do a few extra uh, frames of artwork and words to explain situations that might not be in the uh, direct frame of reference of, of modern readers who have not studied World War II or the Cold War or uh, in some cases, uh, stories that go even uh, further back than that. Um, so the trick was getting uh, a viable story, getting it in a way that uh, uh, could be well illustrated by uh, Wade. Wade, why don't you uh, talk about the artwork? So what's interesting about a lot of uh, the ones we're gonna see in a few minutes and including the one here under Dave's picture with his uh, writing his own story with his quill there, which I love, uh, you're seeing the, the entire CCH team has to look at the uniforms. They have to provide the historical accuracy of the characters that we're portraying in these eras. And so it's it's not, um, it the picture takes some time to get there sometimes. You're also seeing uh, advancements in the apps that I'm using for the digital drawings that allow me to get the shading just right with the candlelight there and the books that are stacked. Uh, sometimes using the body of another historical character and then the the face and the portrait of the individual that we're portraying so it's very exciting to do the the many different layers that dave's describing to get these pictures um, to you but it's also an opportunity for me to grow as an artist drawing more digitally what you're seeing today i'm doing is marker and ink on paper but to do it digitally has really been rewarding to add the text and the different layers and um and to show these pictures in different cells. This is an individual cell uh, learning about codes in the Civil War and, and how they were um, used on both sides and what happened when people that had learned these codes were on both sides literally and they had to start to shift the way that they uh, had tactics. So I think we can go to the next slide, right, Dave? Yep. 
which is also yours. So kind of uh, some behind the scenes on how these things work. Portraits obviously take a lot of time to get the accuracy and, and sometimes we don't have a portrait. So sometimes we don't have the angle of a portrait. So uh, Dave and I have to be really flexible and fluid in, in what we're trying to portray. Uh, to Dave's credit, he, not only does he write the story in a very succinct way that I can put on the page, but he also has an idea for how he'd like things laid out in the different scenes as they've taken place in offices in the 1960s and what happens when the Enigma is functioning in a certain way or um, the the color picture on this slide where the person was in Japan in the garden when they realized that a certain circumstance had taken place. So all these things take um, a lot of coordination between he and I. Uh, it starts with him sending me a scenario and sometimes a few weeks of me digesting it. And then even just going on walks outside to, to figure out how I'm gonna draw it, ways I'd like to arrange it, uh, how I can show something in a more unique way. But it's not just sit down and draw and pop it out into a JPEG and send it to CCH and they post it. Uh, there is a lot of different layers. Uh, the, the submarine in the bottom right was a really interesting thing for me to draw because you know, how do you get that water effect on the submarine and show the depths and even the bubbles coming out of the top? Uh, all these things were new territory for me as an illustrator. And thanks to the CCH and their confidence in me to try these things and Dave being an awesome teammate and going back and forth with me saying, maybe we should try this or a little more of that or, oh, I didn't think of it that way. That was great. Uh, it really is a great team effort. I'm, I'm very fortunate to have such a team that supports uh, the artwork, especially. Any other thoughts on this slide for you, Dave? Uh, no, but on the next one. Go for it. <clears throat> next slide, please. Uh, well, wait a minute. Uh, this is yours also, sorry. That's okay. So I mentioned earlier the America's first spy story, the crypto comics, and how um, we go back as far as the Revolutionary War um, and different messages that were being sent back and forth. Here we have the Rosetta Stone um, in, the, in the middle across the bottom there. We've got uh, Civil War soldiers that are using different color flags. We've got um, how certain individuals and their families were raised. When we talk about Juliana, um, Ernestine von Mickwicks, um, Dave has given me lots of uh, great names to spell and different characters that played a role in history. And it's just remarkable for me drawing these different events and bring them to life, how it just never really landed on me when I read it. So what John and Dave were describing and their love of comic books is also happening for me as the artist. And it's been a great journey so far. We try to do these uh, fairly regularly. Uh, some of them are very complex, three to four pages at a time. Some of them are standalone illustrations. And now we've even looked into how do we recycle some of the standalone portraits or different scenes that can aid in other History Today articles. Any other thoughts on this, Dave? Um, no, I think you've explained this very well, uh, but if you don't mind, I'll take the next one. Please. Uh, next slide, please. This was, I think, our second crypto comic. The first one was the story of the uh, development of the National Security Operations Center, NSOC, and that was sort of a transition. It was a written story that Wade illustrated. Uh, this one was a, uh, began as a daily article that I was reviewing, and all of a sudden it, it was an aha moment for me. It said, this is one that can really be told more with pictures than with uh, text. But as it turned out, there was plenty of text too. This was the first one that really meshed the illustrations and the, uh, the, the, the verbal uh, messages uh, in, into a, a, a new form and used both to tell the story instead of just depending on one or the other as, uh, as an adjunct. Uh, it's the story of William Friedman and one of his early successes that made his reputation. And I like to think not only did this make uh, Friedman's reputation, but it made the crypto comics reputation as well. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, we have, uh, 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 as Wade uh, noted, um, tried to get real individuals in our uh, uh, artwork as um, 
accurately as possible to what they actually looked like, and of course the artifacts in each uh, drawing uh, to what they looked like. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, we have uh, had quite a number of guest stars, uh, people whose uh, visage uh, or figure uh, is well known to uh, to most who uh, certainly know history, uh, many who just uh, know uh, about America's heritage. And uh, I've always been uh, impressed with not only a likeness, but the way the artwork is uh, focused and shaded, gives you an impression of the person as well as uh, just what they uh, what they look like. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, Wade, jump in if uh, you want to say more about any of these, but. Um, yeah, I, um, I think what I try to do with my clients, honestly, is to give them a piece of a visual that they can use in many different forms. I think if it was a one and done, it'd be a little less rewarding for me as an artist, but knowing that I can draw a portrait of Edgar Allan Poe and it can be used multiple times for different purposes, whether Dave is presenting to orientation for NSA employees or whether it's going to align with an article that's being written or with the particular piece that we developed it for in the first place. So to the, the CCH's credit, they, they take these and they find different uses for them. And that's truly rewarding for me when we create it because a lot of work does really go into it. Um, I've also found that I could see the growth of me as an artist in these pictures, which is a very vulnerable moment for me. But just knowing from what we did in the very first one with William Friedman, just some of the last, the later portraits, uh, it's exciting for me to see the growth and to know that when you arrive at a project, you shouldn't be at your best. You should probably be leaving a project at your best. So to CCH's credit, they've allowed me to grow as an artist, uh, as a creator in this space, doing something that's fairly new. And I think that's something we should all seek out, quite frankly, in the teams that we're working on and the, and the type of work we do. Yeah, yeah that's uh, recycling at its best. And in fact, uh, the CCH made a presentation two years ago to a Baltimore convention about Edgar Allan Poe, at which we recycled uh, many of Wade's drawing in, in, as part of our slide deck. Uh, and this one also as an advertisement for this afternoon. I'm uh, presenting something on uh, uh, a Navy uh, World War II topic, and I was able to recycle several of Wade's drawings to uh, help illustrate this topic. Uh, next slide, please. At one point, uh, the History Center was asked to suggest an artifact uh, to be presented as a, a gift by our director to uh, a, a second party uh, partner. Uh, none of the artifact suggestions were practical or uh, really uh, looked like they ought to uh, uh, be treated as a gift. So the light went on and we said, how about a piece of original artwork? So working with Wade, uh, we developed uh, uh, a piece of uh, really good looking uh, original artwork uh, that symbolized in many respects uh, the cooperation between ourselves and uh, our British partners. Uh, so uh, this skill, this experience has paid off in, in more than just uh, storytelling. Next slide. Dave, Dave if, you, uh, if you could hold here, can oh, you go, uh, back? go back? One, uh, one, one fun part that we learned is how could we insert uh, some addi additional personality into these pictures? And if you want to tell them the story about the frame and what we did with the code, I remember just how uh, you, you were giggling, I think you and John, when you were developing the messages and the potential of what could be sent over to the UK partners to kind of thank them for this partnership. Uh, do you remember what it says? I'm, I'm forgetting at the moment. Well, I, I, I resent the fact that I, uh, you, um, I uh, <laughs> if I'm going live here, uh, that's my I, just, I, re, I resent the characterization of my uh, 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 triumphant chuckles as giggling, uh, but nonetheless, uh, uh, there there are some additions here. Uh, uh, wasn't down to Wade or to me, but uh, John Tokar developed uh, some actual coded messages uh, that were uh, worked into the uh, the border of this uh, drawing, uh, just for a little added impact at a, at a uh, fellow uh, cryptologic agency. 
Um, next slide, please. Uh, don't have a really, uh, you know, spectacular finish here, uh, but this is one of our famous uh, and favorite drawings. Uh, one of our historians at the CCH wrote an article about um, the time that uh, uh, an ill-advised uh, Ill uh, program was run where uh, somebody invited a hypnotist to speak uh, at a uh, uh, seminar or something at NSA. So we uh, had Wade uh, draw this illustration for the article. And if you look closely at it, next slide, if you look closely at it, you are getting very, very sleepy. Uh, well, of course, it could be that we've been running on too long here. So let me just uh, put up the last slide uh, and say uh, all of our uh, crypto comics uh, are available online at www.nsa.gov. Uh, and uh, if you, I, I, I'm pretty sure a few members of our audience have missed any, but if you have, they're all there for you to uh, enjoy. Uh, and uh, for your kids and your grandkids too. Wade, would you like to have a last word here? Uh, I, again, this is just one of those moments where it's really nice to be part of something new. I think um, that's a dream that I think many of us have in the work that we do and the things we can bring to the table to just pioneer something. So I, I'm just grateful for the CCH uh, taking a chance on a visual historian, kind of carving out a new role so that we could do things like this and finding different ways to reach our audience it's been a tremendous growth opportunity for me. And just to be able to present today and then go back to listening is kind of funny because I'm usually the person in the background. So thanks for bringing me forward to, to chat about this. I really appreciate it. All right. Yeah, happy to have you, Wade, and glad glad you did. Um, thanks, Dave and Wade. It was really fascinating. I hope I hope we haven't sort of broken the uh, the artist equivalent of like the magician's code where you don't reveal how the trick is how the trick is done because listening to you wade talk about the different ways um that you had to learn how to capture things and i was like wait are we telling the audience too much or just let them see the magic um but anyway it's it has been a great uh journey as as dave and wade both explained it's been very uh the, you know the idea is not revolutionary but the way we sort of started small and grew to what we're doing now is is very much evolutionary, but uh, but its impact can can be felt, and we see it. In, you know, we can measure the graphics. Uh, sorry, measure measure the uh, metrics that we see on on uh, on our on our websites for for how many people are are seeing it and uh, and or liking it. Um, there are a couple of questions in the in the uh, uh, comments and questions in the in the chat. So uh, Melissa says uh, Wade's. Uh, just a comment, Wade sketching is phenomenal. Um, we will post um, eventually the sketch notes on on our uh, public facing website. Um, and here's a question from anonymous Dave and Wade. Do you have a favorite? And uh, I know that's a loaded question, but uh, anyone would either of you like to take that? You first, Dave. Uh oh, OK. Uh like any good writer or journalist, my favorite is the next one. Oh, great answer. <laughs> set, uh, set you up, Wade. Oh, I know. I I really liked the Civil War piece that we did um, and the different layers that went into that and the study of history to bring codes forward. I mean, I think there are some people we talked in one of the earlier talks today about cryptography and the assumption that technology was required, and that's not the case. Um, even one of the talks we're going to have later today. So I, I think that one was, I learned the most from that one, and I really enjoy drawing the drawings for that one. So I, that's mine. Yeah, it's it's hard for me to pick one. I, I, I do, uh, I like the beneath the surface. Not only is the the text and the content fantastic, but it's it's a single page, so that works in, in on a variety of different platforms. But the other one that resonated with me a lot is also War Two, and that's the Baron uh, Oshima uh, comic. I thought the artwork in that in particular was uh, was really great. So, 
Thank you. Anyway, we're going to we're going to wrap it up, but I, you know, as Dave pointed out, this, this this medium has really been accepted as a way of of, of a new way of present new ish. I mean, obviously comic books go back a long way, but I'm talking about in terms of academic history being presented this way. I mean, there are things like like this, you know, this is 100 pages describing how the Constitution was written in in graphic novel format. Um, I have this one from uh, an Asian artist. That's the entire text of Sun Tzu's Art of War uh, done graphically, and it's this one's in black and white, but it's uh, it, it, there really is sort of no no end really no end of options for how to how to do this kind of thing. So um, we hope you like it as much as we do. You can obviously tell that Dave and Wade and I are passionate about it, but from the feedback we do get, uh, most you know a lot of our audience tends to like it. Um, so anyway, um, any final thoughts, Dave and Wade? We're gonna <clears throat> wrap up. No thanks. I'm I'm excited to go back to listening. It's funny. I don't I don't present in front of the camera much anymore these days, John. So thanks for bringing me out of the shadow. Well, you, you did a great job, Wade. And and as people are saying, the the sketch noting uh, is better than ever. It's uh, it's really great, and we're looking forward to uh, I guess Elephant Cage is up next. Elephant Cage is up next. I've already drawn it out. It's in the feed so people can see what I start with an anchor graphic just as a little behind the scenes. If I just did all text and had to start anywhere on the page, sometimes it's a little daunting. So if you're looking at the, the video feed now, there's a picture of Anchorage, Alaska with the elephant cage in the middle and even a picture of an elephant. So you'll just have to wait till 1215 to see the rest. Well, I've been I've had the feed up all morning uh, on a separate uh, monitor in 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 our pre presentation space here, and it's been uh, it's been almost uh, dangerous to have it going while I'm supposed to be paying attention to other people's uh, talking, but it's uh, it really is. It really is amazing, and we will make these available to to the audience uh, digitally at a later later date. So, thanks again, both of you, and uh, see you down the road. Thanks again, everybody. Yep. yep.